Okay, we're going to cover the main power runs from the batteries to the Viking aircraft engine. What you've got is two batteries. Uh, that's your basic setup where you start out. You get yourself two lithium ion batteries from Shulrite, part number LFX 24A3-BS12. Or you, these are the 24 amp charge or allowable charge batteries. They also have some 36 amp batteries, which are the same size, but they're more money. So, I mean, their basic physical size are the same. They do have more capacity. So it's up to you. These are large enough, and they will start the engine, and so far. But if you want more battery capacity, go with the other ones. Um, what we've got here is a setup where a power cable runs to the input side of a contactor that you buy from Aircraft Spruce. This is all listed on our website, these part numbers. Or you can also, for all these items, you can get it in what we call a grab bag on the Viking website shopping cart where you will get all this uh, type of cable and the type of terminals and boots and all this stuff, the solenoids will be all packaged for you. Now. What you have is a power cable going to the input side of this solenoid, the input side being the side that's marked with a plus sign, and it says BATT for battery. Same thing with the other solenoid that's mounted right here. We've got from the positive side of this battery a cable running to the input side or the positive battery side of this contactor. And that's all there is to it as far as the dual battery system. Sounds complicated, but it isn't. What you've got is just an input from each battery to the positive side of the solenoid. At that point, now you have a system where you can connect the other two sides of the solenoids, the output sides. They get connected with a large gauge or a six gauge cable, and then you can add your electricity that you need for the engine and starter and airplane and all that, and the input from the alternator to any to this terminal or this terminal because they're ex they're connected. Now, in order to select which battery you either are charging, since these are now connected, or using, all you have to do is ground this terminal with a switch in the airplane in order to close this solenoid, and you will be feeding the alternator juice through here and up to this battery. And if you close this one, you will be transferring the alternator charge to the other battery. Now it's the same for the output. When you have selected battery one using one solenoid, then you will be drawing from that battery when you start the engine and when the engine is running. Or vice versa, if you select this one through your toggle switch in the cockpit, uh, what that toggle switch does is ground this terminal and you hear a click from the solenoid, it closes, and you will be selecting the opposite battery. So you can also follow this in detail on the wiring diagrams. What is important, more so with this physical wi video, is that you understand the seriousness of what you're doing. You do want to make a very organized, very nicely laid out uh, arrangement of the wiring. You don't want to make any inferior crimps. You don't want it to solder anything. You want to have the proper tooling to make the crimps on the lugs. You want to get the type of battery terminal lugs that are heavy duty and you want to use lock washers and the proper torque on all the fasteners. Just all basic, very basic aircraft quality workmanship, but that's something that you do have to learn in order to have a quality installation like this. Now, the power that is leaving, we already talked about the alternator, and that wire is coming in from the alternator and being either split to this battery or the other battery, uh, depending on which one of these are closed, charging them or if both switches are up, you're charging both batteries. Of course, if you have both of these connectors closed, meaning that both batteries are hooked up and available for starting the engine or, and being charged, you, in essence, have one battery. So if there is a problem in your electrical system, you now have a short and you will take and wipe out both batteries. So that is not recommended. The reason to have a backup battery is to have standby power. So you do want to make sure that your standby battery is fully charged, and you do that by flying one flight on battery one, go on another flight as far as flying back home or whatever, flying on the other battery. That allows you to utilize both batteries 
one at a time. You can use both for starting, but as soon as you start the engine, you would then flip off the one that you're not going to be using. The output, the heaviest output from the connection between the two solenoids is the starter cable. And it runs up here and it comes through here and it goes to the starter, which is located right here. This smaller terminal that you're looking at right here is from the Viking bus. And it is what actually actuates the solenoid in the starter. You see this wire going in right here. What we're using is just a regular spade terminal that goes in there. You can also obtain from uh, maybe from a salvage yard a Honda specialized plug that will fit on here and use the provided lock. But just a regular aviation grade spade terminal too would work. It sticks right into here. That's the this wire is label for label with the Viking power bus. It just says to the starter solenoid and that's the wire that goes to the power bus. The other one that is located right below it here is the six gauge cable that uses a 12 millimeter wrench or socket to be tightened against the starter. And that's the one that actually provides the power to the starter from either battery A or battery B depending on which solenoid is selected. Let's talk about the instrumentation on a Viking engine. What you're seeing here is a Viking engine installed in an S-19 aircraft. Instrumentation is very simple. With the Viking view, every sensor is already installed and there's a wire harness that exits the back of the engine. This does not have a Viking view and it would have a connector just hanging here that you would plug into the airplane and you're done. Well, if you are using your own instrumentation, such as Dynon, Grand Rapids, uh, MGL, or whatever, you would have to add your own sensors as well as your own wiring. Now, here is a Dynon setup. This is a probe that is screwed into the gearbox and it is providing gearbox temperature to the instrument. Notice how we have used the aft one here so that the forward port is still available for filling the gearbox with oil. The cable is supported with ADAL clamps that are located and screwed into the gearbox. We're following this over and we're now getting to an area that has the location of all the other sensors. This is the coolant temperature probe that is screwed into the engine and it has a wire that runs to the Dynon instrument. We then move up here and we're seeing a machine part with two sensors in it. This is for the oil temperature, and this is for the oil pressure. The Dynon requires ground and positive for their sensors as well, and this time we just conveniently grounded the sensor right here, since it was so close to this grounding port. And that's all there is to the sensors and the instrumentation. Uh, as I said, it's the easiest way to go is with the Viking view. Um, this way, now with the Dynon, it will be nice when it's all done, but the next procedure is to run the wires into the airplane, uh, find where they go on the uh, Dynon instrumentation, then program the instrument to read what you want it to read, put the parameters in, and it uh, can be a steep learning curve for everyone, so we do recommend our own product, which is the, the Viking View, plug and play. And that covers the installation of sensors as what is needed. I do want to quickly mention that the engine does not need EGTs or CHTs because it is a liquid cool engine. What is a nice thing to add, and which we do highly recommend because it tells you a lot about your engine, is an oxygen sensor monitoring system. It's a wideband oxygen sensor, and you do see this port that's already provided to you on the back of your muffler. What you do is you go to Amazon or uh, Jags or uh, Summit Racing or someone that sells racing equipment, even eBay has them, and you search for a wideband air fuel ratio monitor or sensor. Once you find what you want, a gauge that you like, and preferably one that has a Bosch sensor, you install this according to the diagrams that come with it. This will tell you a lot of information about your engine as far as the correct fuel air mixture at idle or at full power or at cruise and it will then also tell you if it ever changes as is if you had a bad spark plug, a leak in a fuel injector, 
that was seeping fuel more than it should, a clogged fuel injector, bad fuel, uh, clogged fuel filter, weak fuel pump, bad fuel regulator, uh, bad uh, intake leak, and on and on and on. So we highly recommend that you uh, use our expertise and our uh, prefer and, and buy one of these gauges and install it in your airplane.